Uh, and so there are more mitos, mitochondria, in your brain than any other organ uh, other than the heart. Uh, and what do these do? We're talking about every cell in your brain has roughly about 500 of these mitos. And they move where the action is. So 80% of the 20% of your entire energy in your entire body goes to the synapses. So in other words, what we're doing right now, simply by talking, is moving mitos around at the synapse. <laughs> and if you have a 25% reduction in mito activity at the synapse, you get brownouts. And so how do you bring that down to earth? Well, you gotta talk about how uh, the, all that power is even produced so you don't end up instead producing free radical damage to not only your mitos, but also the cells surrounding. And so there's a use it or lose it phenomenon here. You've got to have the right fuel coming into the mitos. Uh, and then you've got to use the ATP, all that power, or you blow out the mitos like a nuclear meltdown. Dr. John Arden, thank you so much for joining us once again here on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. Great to see you. Oh, great seeing you too, as always. And I yeah. enjoyed our, our dinner uh, there at Brisbane at the conference. Yes, right. you, you jet set are you. Uh, it, was, it was fantastic. <laughs> we were we were so pleased. It's such it's such fun. We we always get together and uh, and the conversations are always vibrant and uh, 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 and this was no different. It was, it was always fabulous. Oh, absolutely, to see. it was a far-reaching global discussion about Ukraine and. Uh, geopolitical dynamics and everything else. It was it was quite uh, memorable. Yes, As I I always <laughs> worry about the people sitting nearby. Uh, I, I remember our last conversation. We were sitting there having a fabulous talk about genetics and complex systems, and I wasn't yeah. sure whether the people nearby should uh, 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 chastise us or pay us money. <laughs> well, they all got up and leave, left. Did, yeah, did you notice that they cleared out? <laughs> Only because we were the last people left in the restaurant. <laughs> we were the last people left. But but besides uh, you know reconnecting and re-engaging, uh, you've been reconnecting and re-engaging with your writing with one of your fabulous uh, books from well not from the past but one of the fabulous books you've done and it's a little while and it's rewire your brain which now is a second edition of 2.0 uh, and we just wanted to talk to you about it because. Um, uh, obviously, you've done some interesting new things. I can see some stuff. We've got a few questions we want to ask you. But what was the what was the process, John? What um, what led you to sort of think I want to I want to you know get it because you got to you got to write quite a bit of new material. What what were you doing? Well, as you know, uh, both of you know quite well um, that this larger field that we call psychotherapy, neuroscience, uh, healthcare is changing so rapidly that a book written 12 years ago is out of date. Mm. <laughs> and uh, you've got to keep up to date. And one of the most exciting things about our field in general is the demand to keep up to date. It's exciting. And so I looked at what I wrote 12 years ago when Rewire the Brain, actually 13, and uh, realized that, geez, you know, that's a old book. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I better add some new stuff in there that is more, um, uh, not just up to date, but more compelling. Because I think that, that in the last decade, uh, there have been so many remarkable things, uh, such as epigenetics and uh, metabolism and, uh, uh, including, as we often talk about complex systems and everything else, that, that need to be incorporated. And then how can you bring it down to earth? I mean, those are pithy terms, you know, not pithy, but those are psychobabble terms, you know, epigenetics and uh, psychoneuroaminology and metabolism and all that. But how do you bring it down to earth to your clients? And that was why what I was trying to do with this so-called 2.0, rewire your brain 2.0. Yeah, absolutely, and and the 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 first book was um, very pivotal in in my experience of you know 
being introduced to this sort of material, very practical, very, you know, talking at, you know, sort of layman's level. And, and I really appreciate that. So what is new? And, and you, we were just talking before we started the recording that um, there's quite a significant amount of new material that needs to go into a second edition. So take us through what's new. Well, let's just take the second chapter that's entirely new. In that chapter, I, I really tried to bring down to earth the whole concept of energy and metabolism. And also another section of that book was about epigenetics and another section of that book was about the immune system. And then how do you put it all together? So let's start with energy and um, um, how, how can you not necessarily throw around the word mitochondria and adenosine triphosphate over and over again and bring it down to earth to uh, clients? So I'm calling them mitos. It's easier to remember mitos than mitochondria. And instead of remembering ATP or even adenosotriphosphate, you could say all that power. Uh, oh. So anyway, <laughs> what, I, what I describe in this uh, section of that chapter is what the heck are these things? And the, the most remarkable um, uh, kind of discovery in many ways or awakening for me was how little we in the healthcare field even talk about energy. We talk about it in metaphorical ways. In fact, some mm. people go off and talk about prana and chi and, and you know, metaphors like, you know, does he have the energy to do this and, and all that. But it is so fundamental, especially to the brain, because it's the highest energy consumer in the body, including the heart and the liver. Uh, and so there are more mitos, mitochondria, in your brain than any other organ uh, other than the heart. Uh, and what do these do? We're talking about every cell in your brain has roughly about 500 of these mitos. And they move where the action is. So 80% of the 20% of your entire energy in your entire body goes to the synapses. So in other words, what we're doing right now, simply by talking, is moving mitos around at the synapse. <laughs> and if you have a 25% reduction in mito activity at the synapse, you get brownouts. And so how do you bring that down to earth? Well, you gotta talk about how uh, the, all that power is even produced so you don't end up instead producing free radical damage to not only your mitos, but also the cells surrounding. And so there's a use it or lose it phenomenon here. You've got to have the right fuel coming into the mitos. Uh, and then you've got to use the ATP, all that power, or you blow out the mitos like a nuclear meltdown. Right. I, I love the yeah. metaphors. I love the metaphors. And yeah. so and so this is where you, you talk a lot about like you said, use it or lose it. And so being engaged um, with learning new things, with reading, with um, you know intellectual things, you know, this is very important. Exactly. And we've talked previously about the five healthy factors, the yep. seeds, right? And just in what you just noted, you mentioned two of the seeds elements. Uh, you mentioned use it, cognitive activity, that's education. Uh, and in terms of the actual fuel, there's two uh, seeds elements there. And that, that is your diet. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, you've got to also the exercise factor and also breathing <laughs> simply uh, and how you breathe. So the fuel comes in, oxygen and the glucose broken down from the food that you eat. And then there's this electron transport chain within your mitos that produces ATP. And if you don't use it, you just sit around and just talk about mitos and don't use the energy. <laughs> um, then you start blowing out your mitos and then you can't think clearly. Uh, and let me just add in one more thing. Uh, another one of the seeds element is sleep. So we, we talked before we started uh, this discussion about uh, my jet lag having just come from down under. Well, you know, my mitos aren't working so well because I <laughs> have such poor sleep during the last couple of days. So there's another one of the seeds elements. Yeah, and it's so interesting you know, for those who want to go into it, at some depth, but the the ATP. There's a uh, uh, I, I love the different pronunciations from different schools. The adenosine uh, 
but <laughs> dry phosphate. But the the whole system, this this um uh, you know central nucleus, and and that there is actually particularly with sleep. Um, so lack of sleep, what it does is it is it works out how not to produce the the triphosphate and actually produces a, a an adenosine a sort of a, a flood of that because it's not doing the stuff which is designed to give you a brownout which is to say go to sleep you know uh, stop doing this and of course the, the, the trouble is in our, our pushed society. Uh, I mean, that interesting bit of biochemistry, you know, go have a look that up. But what it is, is in our pushed society, we're deliberately um, through lack of sleep or through the fact that we have um, uh, our immune system is very busy, uh, a desire to quieten down, you know, sickness behavior and, and sleep debt behavior. But we push through, push through, push through, push through. And we actually make ourselves so vulnerable for disease, let alone the inability to think. Uh, those sorts of bodily interactions are really concerning, aren't they, John? Oh, exactly. And, and uh, a great segue to talk about epigenetics because yeah. um, we're talking the push through society, you know, we're looking at computer screens late at night, you know, whatever we're doing to decrease our sleep quality, in fact, you know, the, in terms of sleep architecture and all that, we could then start producing genes that we don't want to have turned on. So in this new field of epigenetics that we've talked about before, we know now that we have far more of this so-called non-coding DNA than any other species. So only roughly 2% of our DNA you could call genes. And genes basically are just simply recipes for amino acids. They don't do anything else, they're inert. And in fact, you can look at a dinosaur bone and look at their DNA, but the dinos aren't alive, right? You need energy to use all the me mechanisms within each of your cells to actually produce protein. In other words, extract the, uh, the, the recipe from your DNA, your DNA with RNA and go over to your ribosomes to produce these proteins. But if you don't sleep, now you're turning on genes that really are um, gonna promote the consumption of very poor, uh, poor foods like simple carbohydrates. And then you're gonna start turning on genes that increase inflammation. So now you add in the immune system here and you've got inflammation, not only in your gut because you're consuming a lot of simple carbohydrates and all that because you think you need energy, but it's fool's gold. It really isn't good energy. You create instead chronic inflammation. And then as a result of all that, you could literally start shrinking areas of your brain, like your hippocampus and your prefrontal cortex. Yeah. Your body is trying to, to deal with or compensate for the lack of sleep, but that compensation is in the long run maladaptive. It's, it's hurting us, right? So exactly. Yeah, it was really interesting. I was just looking just recently, the, the, the most recent sort of genome um, count uh, just a couple of years ago. But, and they recognized about 64,000 uh, RNA coding um, areas of the, of the DNA, of which about 20,000 of them are protein coding, so they produce mRNA. Uh, but they, you know, as you say, this non-coding, there's, there's there's long coding RNA, there's short RNAs, there's a variety of things that all regulate and are designed to regulate and organise the protein coding um, process, and it's absolutely uh, uh, fascinating uh, to again enter this as a as an exciting uh, sort of story. It, it, the technicalities of it are, mm. uh, take a little while to get a grasp of, but I just look at that now and I go, oh, wow, there's, there's, there's 64,000 and 20,000 of these and 10,000. And, uh, and also they've, just, they've pretty much determined that, that a single um, uh, mRNA or a single protein coding uh, gene combined with some of the others will produce about three to four uh, end results, so three to four different things, which gives us an understanding of why just with 20,000 genes, we can actually have this rather complicated body. So we actually have 20,000 genes, but you multiply that by four. I mean, it's just so interesting. There's so mm. much potential uh, 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 for future excitement about what we can do, but we keep interfering.
with that. And and your book goes in, and I, I love it in the description. It just says uh, practical self-help tips. Uh, and I think that's what we need. Yeah, yeah, because we, the three of us, can talk about all these really intricacies related to the many, many different types of RNAs, as you began to describe and as your book describes as well, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, are fascinating to us. But what about our clients? They, you know, they're not going to dive in that deep. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really. And it's enough to say DNA because it's used as a metaphor. It's the DNA of the, com of the company, the DNA of the society, and all. They don't even know what the heck DNA is. That's enough. Uh, and so we we got to, yeah, we're fascinated by it. But what I think is most important is people can take command of their own bodies and brains by their behavior. And if they know a little bit about the science of it in a very down to earth sort of way, then they can be more confident that those behaviors that we suggest are really good behaviors as opposed to, oh, well, we recommend it because we have these fancy degrees. Yeah, um, no, exactly. Well, there's also a lot of stuff that's out there, which, which I know because I know the science. I'm going, no, maybe that exercise is good, but what you're saying is not uh, true or at the least accurate. This is the uh, another concerning, a concerning element. Yeah, yeah, and and let's take exercise because it, you know, again, one of the seeds elements and everything is probably the most powerful of them all because we don't do enough of it. We do a little bit of okay feed, you know, feeding ourselves, but we eat some junk here and there, but we're, you know, we balance it a little bit, but some people literally don't move at all. But as hunter gatherers, we were moving 10 miles a day. There's very, very few people that actually do that. Now, mm. how does that relate to ATP, all that power? Again, wow, you got burnt out meltdown mitos as a result of not doing that. Now, let me just go on about the mitos a little bit because there's really an interesting uh, shelf life issue related to mitos. They have roughly a shelf life on, if they're normal, roughly two weeks to about a month, you should be recycling your mitos. And in the aging research, uh, people uh, that are, uh, you know, taking a look at the different aspects of aging, including the blue zones and all that, are talking endlessly about these zombie cells, you know, these cells that are in our body with, uh, you know, people that are advancing in age that are really kind of struggling to continue to stay alive. You know, they look like they're alive and, you know, they move from room to room and all that, but they have zombie cells. Why do they have zombie cells? Because they're not recycling their mitos. And so how do you recycle your mitos? Here's the interesting thing about free radicals. You don't want to have no free radicals because your free radicals get rid of the dead cells. They help you with your immune system. They actually help recycle your mitos through what we call myopathy, so to speak. In other words, killing off the weak mitos. So uh, biogenesis, which is the birth of new mitos, can even develop. And then there's this fusion fission aspect of the mito, the, your metabolism. And that is the healthy mitos need to congregate and fuse together, whereas your unhealthy mitos uh, need to be killed off. And if they aren't, then you've got zombie cells. And what uh, are zombie cells? You've got a bunch of dead thinking people out there. That Yeah, yeah deadens your thinking. It, it disrupts the, the, the flow. Well, as Dan Siegel says, you know, that flow of energy information, that movement. And um, because uh, this is something that might be useful just as a simple reminder that uh, it's sort of the cells have to fire. We have got what called an action potential. And if it hits a zombie cell, then that flow just, peters out and uh and so people sort of say well, well what was i thinking what 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 was that and that's when it's hitting this it's not creating a flow just because just because there's millions and billions of neurons up there doesn't mean they they work yeah. john i've got exactly. a question i've got a question for you about um people with a, a, a higher metabolism so um, and, and I know a few people, you know, they're, they're skinny sticks and they can eat whatever they want and they cannot exercise. And, and it still, it looks like, you know, that they're, they're relatively healthy, um, but they don't move around a lot. And I'm just wondering, is the same thing happening in them? Um, or does, does an elevated metabolism change the picture for them? I'm not sure. 
boy, that's a complex subject, but let, let's dive into it a little bit. And in a sense, we'll get brainstorm together because there's also this phenomenon called skinny fat. Right. <laughs> in other words, you <laughs> look like you're really um, in pretty good shape because you're skinny, so to speak. Yep. But is your metabolic, the question is really, is your metabolic rate up there? Now, what is skinny fat? Well, you look, you look pretty thin except for a little bit of a belly. Uh, so in other words, you've got the fat in the wrong place. Right. And if you've got the fat in the wrong place, uh, is that really a higher metabolism? Well, in fact, what you're doing is you're messing up your immune system because that elevated fat is called the apple shape, so to speak, uh, starts elevating your immune system to turn on your uh, uh, innate immune system to adapt by creating more chronic inflammation because mm -hmm. now fat cells are circled by other fat cells. And, and mm -hmm. uh, if you can, I always like to use this analogy of the yellow tape around a crime scene. Um, right. And so that's what inflammation does. Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, it seals off an area. That's not a good thing. If you've got extra fat cells clumped in one spot, you look like you're fit, but you're really not. Hmm. And it's really the, and sometimes it's not even that vis, uh, visible because it's visceral fat. It's not cutaneous fat. That's right. Cutaneous so that's with, fat within. is more visible. Exactly. Around yeah. your organs. Yeah. And yeah. interestingly, it could be around your mitos too. And oh. within your cells. And so uh, this, this idea of uh, elevated metabolism with some people that look that look fit, they may not actually be fit mm. and they may not actually have a metabolism that's running uh, their metabolic rate in a very effective way to create good mitos in their brain and their heart and all that. So it's a pretty complex subject. Mm. But, you know, I, I was thinking as we were talking about mitos in general, and we kind of inched over to complexity, uh, there's a, one of the founders of, of uh, the Santa Fe Institute uh, quite a while ago, um, named Morowitz. Morowitz wrote a really interesting book that I haven't read, but I've uh, read portions of it referred to in other books. It was written in 1968. And um, uh, he had this really pithy quote. It's so cool. It, it's ener energy, uh, energy is the grand organizer. Energy organizes information is the phrase. Energy organizes information. Information is everything. It's, it's your body. It's the way societies are organized. It's the planet. It's, it's everything. The way uh, complex systems are organized. Energy is what organizes it. Why is that so important? Well, because we wouldn't be alive as a species without the organization of that is fueled by energy. There wouldn't be multicellular creatures without energy that is produced by mitos. So mitos are actually ancient forms of bacteria that were engulfed by other bacteria leading the way to multicellular creatures. So each one of your mitos is really an artifact of bacteria. That's why if you take extra antibiotics, you lower your energy level because you're killing your mitos, not only the bacteria infection or whatever. Really hmm. fascinating because it all comes back to evolution as everything always does. That's an yeah. interesting point about the antibiotics. I, I didn't realize that that would actually touch your um, sort of energy production as well like that. Yeah, <laughs> and it's all related to this artifact of bacteria. That's right. what the mitos were, is bacteria. Hmm. And so, well, that means then that uh, what we're doing, I mean, you know, of course you're gonna uh, wanna have uh, antibiotics if you have this terrible infection and all that, assuming it's, a, it's uh, um, treatable with an antibiotic, but people are taking antibiotics at nauseum for just about everything. They have a cold, uh, like the rhinovirus, it's a virus. Yeah. Antibiotics don't kill viruses. If you have a really terrible sinus infection that's at risk of, you know, going throughout your entire head and affecting your brain, take an antibiotic without a doubt. But you want to have your own body start dealing with some of these factors 
uh, without killing other factors. That's what's so amazing about our body as complex systems. It's not like you can go in it there with linearity and yeah. just deal with one thing and we call the other stuff side effects of the medication. No, they're main effects too. They're just not the effects we like to identify. Yeah, yeah. and I think if th this is something as a therapist, as a psychotherapist, who's, who's dealing mostly with uh, affect and behavior and, and just sort of the felt experience they have, is being aware of this type of uh, possibility, these numbers of things. Uh, certainly someone comes in and they're tired, you say, what's your sleep patterns? And they say, oh, you know, they're pretty good. Uh, and then you have a little look, or maybe you're asking, what, what are some of the things, when medications or additives or supplements you're taking? And of course, some people do it in their, in their uh, intake forms. But uh, another one, which is really uh, important, I think, is for those when we're working with people who are having cancer treatments. So um, uh, because the whole thing, I mean, we've got someone coming up soon with uh, with chemotherapy and, mm -hmm. you know, incredible tiredness is uh, is mm. a fundamental element of it. And what you're talking about, John, is it's just a, a, a great insight into to what's going on amongst the other loads. That, that are causing uh, tiredness from the chemotherapy, but helping them psychotherapeutically is really important. Yeah, and, exactly. And, 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 you know, I'm sure you're the, the guest that you're going to have uh, on your uh, discussion is going to talk about chemo brain and, and all that. I mean, it's like blasting yourself, but you know, if, if it saves your life, cool. It's like taking antibiotics, do it when you really, really, really need it yeah. <laughs> because it's carpet bombing. It kills everything, <laughs> you know, hopefully not you in the process. Yes, it kills everything everywhere. Of course, as your immune system is, is, is systematic um, or more systematic, uh, uh, you know, that's a long discussion as well. But I remember years ago, uh, I was listening to a radio program before I got into all this. And uh, interestingly enough, it was my, my primary school, my, my eight-year-old uh, girlfriend, uh, and anyway, she's a professor of medicine and she was on the radio and she's, she's wonderful. Uh, uh, you, you can see her. She, she's got a podcast out called The Thinker. It's really great. But she said, was talking, right? She said, oh, well, antibiotics, they actually only kill 25% uh, of the infection, uh, but it's the 25% that kills you. But it's, mm -hmm. as you say, it's a blanket. Uh, it kills your gut, um, you know, the microbial in your gut. It kills what's going on and also helps you survive the, the, the terrible bacterial infection. So, again, something else to be aware of as a therapist when someone's on antibiotics or certainly chemo, what's yeah. happening to their gut brain axis? Yeah, this exactly. is important. Which affects your um, not just your immune system, of course, but also epigenetic effects and very clearly the metabolism. Let me just pitch a book uh, because uh, um, the three of us, I'm sure, would be really interested in it. This is a book by Nick Lane. He's a really fascinating guy. The Santa Fe Institute invited him to talk. And I've been paying attention to his books uh, recently because they're so insightful about energy. He's a biochemist from University College London. And the book that I'm reading right now that I've already heard on, on Audible, but I'm going back over again, is called Transformer. And the reason I'm even bringing it up is he's got a section on cancer in there and the so-called Warburg effect that, that's been the dominant kind of one of the dominant theories of, of some of the aspects of cancer. But how much more complex it is than War, Warburg uh, suggested and how critical understanding metabolism is and how it's in part uh, and I, I, I'm not saying the cause, but in part, where you really have to pay attention to the metabolic rate and, and ATP and what ATP is doing when you're understanding some of these cancer, these cells that go wild <laughs> and also create epigenetic effects, uh, hijacking the metabolic system and all that really fascinating stuff. But we're far afield from bringing it all down to rewire your brain. Well, I was just, just thinking. So we, as you say, we're talking about all the beautiful molecular activities. So, okay, so my metabolism is, is down. What am I going to be feeling? Have you got any thoughts about that? Yeah. So let's take one of the most common psychological complaints, which is depression. You know, you have a continuum of depression. It's a, it's a very muddy disorder. 
Um, you know, I, I know people really stuck in a medical model kind of think of it like that, or even think there's, there's a gene that causes depression, which we know is not the fact. And in, in fact, if I could just hum a few bars of, of it, I think you, you hit on it as well in your book. But the so-called short version of serotonin transporter gene was yeah. once thought to be, oh, wow, we found this short version of serotonin transporter gene, and that must be depression, so we need SSRIs and all that. Well, it turns out, actually, if you had the short version of serotonin transporter gene, and you had a really chaotic early environment, yeah, you are more likely to develop some agitation and depression and all that. But notice what I said, early chaotic environment. Now, on the other hand, if you have, let's say, secure attachment or a good enough parenting, a la Winnicott, who I love, great description, uh, then, and again, you have the short version of the serotonin transporter gene, you had good enough parenting, you're actually better off than people that don't have the short version of the serotonin transporter gene. So it's not a depression gene, it's mm. actually responses to various environments. So the environment has a huge effect on epigenetic outcomes. Now, what does it do to metabolism? It, where, where does metabolism take place? in the areas that you're activating. It's a use it or lose it phenomenon. So if you're engaging and have robust, uh, um, warm, compassionate relationships, you're putting a lot of your energy into your spindle cells and your mirror neurons and your connectivity and feeling good about one another, producing more oxytocin, all the kind of stuff that, you know, people like to talk about at nauseum. And in, in fact, even your polyvagal, you know, and your parasympathetic nervous system, you know, we're all over the place talking around the same subject, you know, with different pieces of it. Yeah. Well, uh, there's epigenetic effects uh, to this, including the uh, proliferation of cortisol receptors on your hippo hippocampus and your um, hypothalamus as a result of all this. So, okay, we talked about metabolism, we talked about uh, your immune system, we talked about epigenetics, and then, whoa, what about all this stuff that we've been talking about all along with attachment and attunement and, and you know, the quality of the relationship? It's all interrelated. Now, back to the to the common person on the street that's depressed, what the heck are they gonna do about it? Mm. Well, their metabolism has a lot to do with yeah. the functioning of all these networks because that's what we are, are networks that work together in a nonlinear fashion with all these feedback loops that make us who we are. Yep, there was, uh, that reminds me of a, a study and I can't remember the study now, but I do remember the results. And that was that physical exercise outperformed psychotherapy in terms of mitigating um, depression or reducing depression. Mm -hmm. um, great for personal trainers. Um, <laughs> it, and uh, gives psychotherapists pause to think uh, about uh, what they're rec recommending. Oh, so in fact, not just one study, but multiple studies um, demonstrating the effectiveness of exercise over psychotherapy and antidepressant medication right, and yes. psychotherapy and medication combined for mild and moderate depression. That is humbling. It's yeah. so it because Susie, uh, my, my partner, massage therapist, I mean, she works so hard all day and she's, she's doing that. She's doing the work and uh, we, 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 she gets very tired. And one of the things that she does at the end of the day in order to find, to rebalance, to recalibrate herself is to go for a walk. Yeah. So it's, so the exercise, uh, I mean, we've got to be mind, uh, got to be thoughtful about the, the high impact exercise, which creates sort of shocks and interrupts and sort of affects the allostatic type of loads. And that this, this movement, this, uh, uh, and she, as Susie says, uh, you know, we're 60 to 70% of our biology does nothing but move us. That's what it's mm -hmm. there for. Mm -hmm. And if you get it in the swing, see her problem is her arms aren't swinging and she's not getting, not mm -hmm. getting that flow of activity throughout the, the body, that proprioceptive body. Mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, and so uh, we're fortunate to be by the water and we just go for this lovely walk. We get mm -hmm. all those, those mm -hmm. wonderful uh, uh, nature vibes going through. And, uh, and I think, wow, uh, how do you do this after your work? But it makes it feel better. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, and it does because of a, 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 uh, 
biogenesis. Remember, we were talking about, well, okay, uh, how are you going to get new mitos? You've yeah. got to do what Susie does and you do together uh, on a regular basis because you're not going to get these energy factories without doing it. They're not going to develop. You're going to get zombie cells instead. Right. Right. And I was going to say, it can be very simple, right? Now, John, I believe you go walking up mountains near where you are. Um, and it doesn't have to be a, a complicated thing. Uh, yeah. Can you see down, down there? We have snow in the mountains, so you can't see the top of the mountains. Right. <laughs> but you can see way down there, that road. That's our road. That yeah. Get a mail, uh, down there. But since my jet lag I in the snow uh, that we're getting right now, I didn't go down to get the mail today right. but that's Literally. my minimum that's my but minimum just getting the mail is is yeah. quite a workout yeah <laughs> but yeah. but there's nature's gym uh you know yeah. I, I i love that i mean I, interestingly enough uh, i have I, I my my daughter has produced a, a an excellent gym for me it's called it's called my granddaughter so <laughs> uh, so i i i get a a good workout once a week um, you know, I, uh, I'm picking up 20 kilos and, and <laughs> putting it down again, <laughs> but, uh, no, but, you know, playing in the sand. So it's really, really interesting. This, we also have these natural social mechanisms, yeah. um, you know, dancing, uh, you know, the, the excitement yeah. of telling stories, uh, yeah. all these things, which, which we keep pushing away because we're pushing through, uh, to, to get our jobs done and pay the mortgage and, and, mm. and we're missing mm. which out. is which is often done in a built environment in environments where there's lots of straight lines and things and mm. i know if, when you go out into nature um there's no straight lines uh and mm. just visually even just if we just look at um you know visual perception and processing um it stimulates more of the the right hemisphere it's uh it's a it, and it leads you into more of a, a default um, mode state, which is very rejuvenating um, than in a built environment with a lot of, you know, right angles and straight lines. And, and so that was just something that I picked up along the way as well. Get out into the bush. So let's talk about that, that shift. Uh, you mentioned the default one network. Hmm. And um, we were initially talking about what, what do you do with the second edition of a book? So the last couple of chapters, uh, well, everything I rewrote, but the last two chapters I was making a more current sense of what what is it about contemplative presence or we can call it mindfulness or that you know that happens to be the the flavor of the week in terms of, of calling meditation or contemplative practices by the way even mcdonald's has a mindfulness drive through lane now it's so popular <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you but, just let you just let the burger pass by yeah <laughs> yeah but but there's a really interesting uh cycle that happens with uh these contemplative practices mindfulness or whatever you you could do it while you're walking meditative walk and all that and that is that the cycling through your uh, executive to your salience to your default mode network back to your executive network and so uh, there was, uh, I want to uh, praise an article that came out a couple of years ago in uh, one of the major APA journals called the American Psychologist, which was a big review of all the neuroscience related to meditation. And there are multiple types of meditation, even though right. mindfulness gets all the press right now. And what they were doing is in part what I was trying to do in these last couple of chapters, talk about the cycling, because in fact, you can get stalled out in your default bone network and create a lot of stinking thinking. Right. And so right. really a, a friend of mine, for example, who's Tibetan Lama, uh, talks about the default bone network as being the pause, but you don't want to be paused too long there. Mm. You also need to be here now. So I don't, you guys are too young to remember a book called Be Here Now. Uh, w which was written was written by a I'm guy old. named Ram Das. <laughs> yeah, you, you ever hear of Ram Das? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that was his major book, and that's how he became famous. And he was from just up the road, a piece about an, uh, up oh, north of here. And cool. so I love the title, especially you know, even though the book is you know kind of dated, fifty years ago, and all that. But still, uh, okay. You need to be here now for a while, but you know what? You're gonna, you can't go past 30 seconds before you shift to one of these other states of mind. And so this research related to contemplative practices, mindfulness, whatever you wanna call it, but prayerful presence and so on, depending on whether or not you're atheist or a, 
a believer in a particular theology, is the cycling between these states of mind. The ones that get all the press right now are executive network, default mode network, and the salience network. And in that article and, and subsequent articles, um, a lot of uh, neuroscientists and psychologists are trying to make some sense of that cycling that happens. Yeah. There is no such thing as being here now all the time. You can't do it. Mm, mm. <laughs> Your dorsal yeah. lateral prefrontal cortex can't handle that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, and I think part of that though, John, goes back to the the. I mean, we're moving now into a more uh, acceptance of of complex of complexity of things moving and changing and unreliable. But we were really in linear stuff, and we still have a lot of it, where we're constantly looking for or the single answer to the single issue that you do this, you get that, you do this, you get that. And, uh, uh, but little bit by little bit, I, I think we're, 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 we're engaging in this conversations, I hope, like this, where people hear all these things and there's possibly a tendency for people to say, oh, can't you just talk about one thing? Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is, no, we can't. Yeah. Uh, because it isn't, we are, or, or uh, uh, perhaps the, the, most, the more correct answer is, we are talking about the one thing. We're just talking about its bits. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Right. And, and kind of interesting that you, you mentioned that because healthcare in the, and very important that you mentioned, because healthcare in the 21st century is really about enlarging your picture. Forget mm -hmm. your little world, including your little polyvagal world or whatever it is. I mean, yeah. enlarge your world. Uh, and then you've got to understand the metabolism, epigenetics, psychoimmunology and all that. But at the same time, there's complexity and then there's simplicity because you mm. need to somehow bring it down to earth with your clients. Yeah. So we could swim around with all these complex thoughts and the feedback loops and all that, which I think are really amazingly important. But we also have to synthesize it in a digestible way for our clients and they need to understand what we're talking about because they need a roadmap to feeling better. Yeah, here's, here's, what, here's what it feels like, here's what to do, here's the sorts of things that are gonna come out of it. And, uh, uh, and very often uh, uh, we have an old saying, uh, old joke, where the, the city guy asks the country guy, how do, how do I get to Burke, which is a place out in the, out in the back of the, uh, out in the country. And the, the country guy looks at him and says, well, don't start from here. And so sometimes these things uh, are unnecessary. We need to calm ourselves, settle uh -huh. ourselves. But there's an enormous amount of expansion once we once we get ourselves. And John, we'll, we'll have to wrap up. Uh, I'm afraid there's a million things more to say. But uh, you know, we just can't recommend uh, uh, the 2.0, the the rewire the brain 2.0 highly enough. And uh, we've just given people a, a little little sweet scratch of uh, scratch and scratch and sniff uh, insight into it today. Is, is there anything we've missed or something particularly you want to just close up with, John? Well, you know, that's that's kind of hard to put my finger on. on yeah. it, but I think that the us as practitioners uh, and um, I, I think the title of your book kind of brings it down to earth. You've got to pay attention to the science of psychotherapy, you could say, but you don't need to even call it psychotherapy. You could call it healthcare. Mm, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and if you don't, you don't belong in this field anymore. Uh, and I think that if you can go from the complexity to the simplicity and offer something that's uh, uh, understandable, uh, then you're really helping people in the 21st century. And we've got multiple problems down the line, <laughs> multiple. Uh, and they're going to go through all sorts of adjustments. Uh, right before talking to you guys, I was talking to one of my colleagues in Ukraine about trauma and doing a, a webinar mm. there and all that. And they're dealing with trauma. How do you deal with a, a, a complex trauma? You need to do what we were just talking about throughout. but deliver it in an understandable way because people who have experienced trauma are even less uh, uh, available in their executive network to track what even what you're saying. Yeah, they need to be yeah. taken to where they can start. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I think that's a pretty good spot, Matt. I, I, I love Fantastic. that. Fantastic. Yeah, 
Dr. John Arden, thank you once again for joining us here on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. Oh, thank you, guys. Always wonderful to talk to you. Thanks. We're collaborating. <laughs>